Hello, everyone. So it's great to see so many people out here this evening. Um, you know, it's a packed room. Uh, I hope you've all had a good day, so there's no pressure as the last talk of the day. Uh, so this talk is about exploring the use of the gameplay ability system uh, with an action RPG. Uh, my name's Sam Pike, and I work at Silent Games. Um, so first of all, just a little bit of an introduction about myself. Um, so I've been in the industry for about eight years now. Um, I spent most of that as a freelance. Uh, working on various different VR projects. Uh, almost the entirety of my career has been Unreal Engine so far. Uh, and I've been at Silent Games for the past two years. Um, and so a bit about Silent Games. Uh, Silent Games are based in Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK, uh, which is basically about as far north in England as you can go without it being Scotland. Um, so we were founded in 2018 by two former Ubisoft devs, uh, Sally Blake and Joseph Rogers. Um, and so having done a lot of uh, AAA titles themselves, they wanted to now form what they, we sort of dub ourselves as a AA studio. Um, so we've got a lot more budget than your sort of typical indie developer, um, but we're not quite on the scale of some of your grand AAA developers. So um, we're part of the Amplify Game Invest family. So in November 2020, we were acquired by them, uh, which is ultimately part of the Embracer Group. Um, so yeah, today's talk, um, I'm going to go through four core topics, and I've color-coded, so if you're watching at home uh, in the future, hi. Um, but I've color-coded the edge of the PowerPoint slides so that you can kind of skip through to the relevant sections. So first of all, core concept reminders. Um, so I'm not going to go through the basics of GAS too much. Um, there's a lot of great talks already and some documentation on that, which I'll actually point you to uh, on this uh, presentation. Um, and then we go through to uh, GAS prototype to production. So that's how our team have been using it um, from our initial uh, prototype all the way through to our current full-fledged production. So tips, tricks, and gotchas. Uh, so these are just little odds and ends that I think are useful. Um, it's a bit disconnected at that point because we're just sort of uh, taking a quick leap through different uh, things that I think could be useful to people. Um, and then our GAS system. So a little exploration into uh, some of our systems that we've built that work alongside GAS um, that might be specific to our project. Um, and then some of those uh, might be really applicable to sort of other teams and other projects. So first of all, core concept reminders. Uh, so what is GAS? Uh, well, the Game Playability System Framework, and I've nabbed this straight from the official documentation, so it's dry out of the horse's mouth. Uh, the Game Playability System is a highly flexible framework for building the types of uh, abilities and attributes that you might find in an RPG or a MOBA title. Uh, that's perfect for us. As a studio, we are working on our first title, which is a third-person action RPG. Uh, and of course, that has a lot of different slotted abilities that your character can equip and use, and they have cooldowns and everything like that. Uh, more materialistically, um, it's a plugin for the engine, uh, so you can enable and disable this in your project settings. Uh, so first of all, um, the ability system component. So this is a really important actor component. Um, we either put it on actors that we want to interact with the gas, or we make sure that those actors that don't have that have access to one that they do need. So as an example, um, we might place this on a character um, so that we can access all of their attributes, which I'll get to on, onto in the moment, uh, such as their health, their stamina, their mana, uh, whatever it might be that you have in your particular game project. Um, and then we can even place it on things like destructible objects. Um, so if we want to make all of our destructibles use the same health uh, attribute system uh, and go through the same damage effects, then we can do that. Uh, attributes and attribute sets. So attribute sets are essentially uh, a collection of smart floating point numbers. Um, so they tend to have a current and a base value. Uh, your base value might be something like uh, 100 max health, uh, and the current value might be 120, because you might have applied some sort of modifier that has a 1.2 times uh, scale on what their max health can currently be for a short duration. Uh, so we don't want to modify the base value because we want to revert back to that after some duration. Uh, so a gameplay ability. Um, so this is often shortened to GA at the start of, uh, you know, when you're using your naming conventions, you might have BP for a blueprint. Um, we tend to use GA. Um, so these are self-contained logics for a particular ability, uh, which is fantastic because if you were doing this without gas, you might end up with a particular character blueprint that is uh, a huge monolith of all these different functions uh, and move tos and all these different things. Uh, but because of the gameplay ability system, you can actually break these down to individual blueprints. And of course, these can be C++ as well. Um, but they're really powerful with blueprints because it empowers the rest of the team, not just the programmers, uh, to be able to create gameplay abilities. 
Um, and of course, these don't have to be just your typical gameplay abilities. So these could be uh, attacks, or they could be healing abilities, or, or things like this. Uh, but they can actually be used for some m much more wider utility things, uh, such as moving a character uh, to a chest and opening it, um, or even just a passive ability that always runs in the background, uh, checking for things that are interactable with a ray trace. Uh, gameplay effects, uh, so these tend to be the effects of your GA. Um, they don't have to be uh, directly out of your GA, they can be applied in other contexts as well. Uh, but this is essentially something that you want to modify attributes on your character or whatever the actor is, um, and also apply tags. Uh, so it might be that you're applying a tag to a character that says they're in a god mode right now and they can't take any damage, um, or they've got some iframes at the moment. Um, and of course, modifying attributes, it might be that you're taking damage, so you'd modify the health attribute, um, or it might be that we're uh, going over a health pack and increasing that health value. Uh, these can be infinite, instant, or uh, duration-based. So infinite means that it applies indefinitely until we tell it that it's gonna be removed. Uh, instant is something that has immediate effect and actually changes the base value. Um, so it might be that we, we wanna permanently change the max health of this current character. Um, and duration-based is something that applies for a set amount of time, so I might have a buff that uh, makes my character really strong for the next 10 seconds. Um, and this is a data object as well, so it is a, a blueprint data object uh, that you can uh, modify quite freely and easily. Uh, and last of all, the last couple of core concepts I wanna go through, gameplay tags. Uh, so these are a bit like actor tags. Um, you know, we can add a, a manual string, uh, but the problem with those manual strings is if one developer types it in a certain way and another one misspells it or uses the wrong case, uh, you're gonna start running into issues. So gameplay tags are fantastic because they're actually, once you've created one and added it to the project settings, um, it ends up in a default gameplay tags.ini. Um, and then from that point onwards, it's available as a drop down in the box. Um, so you can use that exact same one without any errors in the future. And of course they're accessible in C++, uh, but you just gotta watch out for those spellings because you've got to manually add the spellings. Um, they're hierarchical. Um, so this might mean that you wanna check um, if something is of a particular state. So you might have uh, state dot, uh, status effect dot stunned. Um, and you can see if they've got any status effect just by checking the parent tag of that. So state dot status effect dot stunned or burned or frozen, uh, you know, any of those things. And you can just check the parent tag um, rather than the individual uh, end leaf ones. Uh, so yeah, great matching system. I've just gone over that, um, spoilers. <laughs> uh, extremely powerful, yeah. So uh, there's so many parts of gas that actually end up using this. It's separate to the engine, uh, sorry, it's separate to the gas plugin. Uh, so you can use this without the gameplay ability system. Um, it's, yeah, just a really powerful system. I'd re recommend looking at it. Um, but it is very integral to a lot of gas. You'll see it used everywhere. Um, and gameplay queues. So these are essentially a wrapper for your FX. Um, this is normally things you don't want running on dedicated servers. Um, so this will be uh, some sort of blueprint actor um, or a burst actor. Um, so burst is something that we fire and forget, like a hit impact on a wall. And we might just want to quickly spawn that in world at a certain location with a certain normal. Um, it, you know, it fires out a Niagara particle system and then it immediately kills itself um, and, you know, we don't have to worry about it in memory. Um, whereas actors might be sticking around for a longer time, so you can tell a gameplay effect that it has a particular cue. So if our character's burning because they're on fire, we might have a Niagara system that's continuously emitting until the gameplay effect is removed, at which point we could automatically remove the gameplay cue. Um, so yeah, these are really, really powerful, um, and it's a great way of separating out the visual effects and the sound effects from the logic of the rest of the gameplay ability or the effect. So where can you learn more? Um, I've got six di uh, different links here. Um, I'll leave this up for about the next 20 seconds while I talk about them, um, and I'll move on to the next one. Uh, but of course, if you're watching at home or you know, if you wanna watch this back later, then uh, there's some QR codes, different links. These are all official resources, and I'll go over some community resources later on. Uh, so first of all, there's the documentation uh, by Epic. Uh, then we have a, a developer live stream um, where they talk you through a guided tour of the gameplay ability system. Um, and then we have a previous year talk from Splash Damage um, about their first year of using the gameplay ability system. And then we have some more talks here from previous Unreal Fests as well. So we have Hero AI. Um, so this is talking about using the gameplay ability system with AI. Um, and behavior trees and things like that. Uh, the benefits and pitfalls of using the gameplay ability system framework. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different pros and cons. I'll touch on some of those today, but there's a lot more in that talk there. And action RPG. So this is the very first example project that Epic released using GAS. Um, it's a simple mobile action RPG title. There's a character who looks very much like a certain 
uh, God of War, let's say. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's a great introduction to Unreal 4, um, sorry, to game playability system, and it runs in Unreal 4. Um, so on to the next topic, uh, gas, prototype to production. So as a studio, uh, we first of all had a prototype that we wanted to improve upon. Um, we had a lot of uh, characters that did things under certain contexts, um, and they were essentially gameplay abilities, but we you know, didn't have them in the real context of gameplay abilities yet. And so we wanted to make all of this work over the network as well. We wanted something that was network ready. Um, and I had previously created various different actor components for things like health and stamina, um, and you know, we had to get those working over the network. Um, they hadn't been network tested before. This has been in a lot of private, um, like personal projects. Um, and then I happened to stumble across GAF, and it met a lot of our requirements, which were to store, access, and manipulate uh, core gameplay values for characters and other entities. Well, there's our attributes right there. Uh, we wanted something that was data-driven, um, so we wanted to be able to very quickly and easily make changes uh, via data assets. Um, we wanted something that was network-ready, um, so our, our game in production now is, uh, it doesn't have real-time multiplayer, it uses asynchronous multiplayer, so we don't explore um, all of the full things that GAS has to offer in terms of waiting for the server to sync, waiting for the client to sync, uh, network prediction keys, all of those things. So there's great resources out there for finding out about network stuff. I probably won't go over too many of them today. Um, and we wanted something that was accessible for non-programmers as well. Um, so being a team of, we're 19 uh, core members of the team now. Uh, there's only two gameplay programmers among that, and then we've got one uh, online backend programmer. Um, so it's incredibly important for us that we could allow um, you know, our designers, our, our sound uh, people, our uh, tech artists all to contribute to that system without needing a programmer support 24-7. So the initial setup of GAS, it's still very C++ heavy. Um, so you probably will need a programmer if you're looking to implement it right now. I believe that Epic are kind of doing what they can to alleviate that and make it more blueprint based so that it can be accessible to more people. Um, but the initial setup is still very C++ heavy. And that's actually very intentional um, because every project has its own requirements. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. You've got to think about things like your attribute sets, um, you know, those are going to be different for different projects. I'll run over what we've settled on for our project. Uh, but of course, you know, that, that might be a simple attribute set that covers just the health and you want to leave it at that and place that on a lot of different objects. Or it might be that you have a very large one that covers everything in the game, uh, including your health, your stamina, uh, your character's mana and all that kind of thing. Um, you also want to work out how to grant abilities to characters. Um, so there's no like out the box solution for this. You have a uh, ability system component function called give ability. Um, but how you give that ability to the character is obviously dependent on your particular project. Um, so with ours, for example, we have data assets that represent an ability. Um, and then in that data asset, we have a soft class reference to the uh, blueprint for the particular gameplay ability, and then we grant it via that way. Um, and of course, when we store uh, that in the save file of what they've got unlocked as an ability, we just store the item data, which is very, very uh, cheap reference uh, to a, a game asset. Um, and how to bind input as well. So we're actually using the uh, enhanced input system, uh, which is uh, a relatively new uh, input system that Unreal have introduced. Um, it's really powerful. Uh, there's a lot of different things in that. Um, it still has its problems, um, but it, it's a lot more promising than the default old UE4 input system. Uh, so it allows you to bind to things such as when a input is triggered uh, and of course, for some abilities, that might be a simple press. For some of them, it might be a hold over time. Um, so that's really a customizable system. But then you want to bind to that to trigger certain abilities. So that might be via a particular abilities ID. Um, and again, this is all dependent on your project. There's some great examples in, uh, I think Lyra does some stuff with it. And also the, uh, I can't remember the name of the project now, but it's the one with Echo. Um, is it that Luminan and Land of Nanite, essentially? Um, but anyway, those uh, projects have some great examples. Um, so our character setup, again, this will depend on your project, but this is just an example of what we do. So if you already use GAS, you might see this and think it looks very familiar. But for others who are just getting started, you can use this as a base plate if you want. Um, so we implement the ability system interface. Um, so this has one really cool function in it, which is uh, get ability system component. So we don't have to cast the exact type of actor to get the ability system component for it. Um, we can just call that. If it returns a non-null non 
pointer, then great, um, we can start using that. Uh, and of course, that means we don't have to return something on that actor. It could be something that that actor has cached, which actually belongs to another actor. Um, but you know, it means we can access that in various different ways. Um, so our character has an ability system component on them. Um, we have our own child class for that, which I'll run over a little bit later on. Um, and it doesn't have to be on the character. I've seen it done on player states. Um, so you might want to sync the, um, the ASC down on a player state and then access it via the character um, with the character's uh, get ability system component pointing to their player state. Uh, and the class uh, constructor for our character, um, we create the default sub-objects, so in this case the ability system component and the attribute set objects. So when our character spawns, um, they are possessed uh, on their possessed by function, we initialize the uh, ability actor info. Uh, so this is essentially passing through to the ability system component uh, who our owner is, and uh, both in a sort of player context, um, and then that could be a, a, just an actor or an AI class or anything, uh, but also uh, who our avatar actor is. So this might be the actual character. Uh, we initialize our attributes. Um, and I'll go over this in a, a little moment because there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, so we just call initialize attributes and when you're first starting out, you might just have a gameplay effect that applies um, and that will then you know, set the max health, for example. Um, but that can get quite cumbersome and I'll run over that a little later in the presentation. Uh, we listen for tags of interest. So for example, we just have an async task that listens for things like uh, when our character's frozen so that we can then fire off delegates for you know, making them slow down uh, making them pause their animations, um, set a time dilation to zero and that sort of thing. Um, we add our startup effects, so there might be some particular characters who need a startup effect, um, so they've already got a buff going out the gates as soon as they spawn. Um, and we bind to the ability activation failed callback, so this could be really good for debugging, uh, because we actually find out why an ability hasn't activated. Um, you know, has it not activated because the character doesn't own it? Um, has it not been activated because it's on cooldown? Uh, is it blocked by a certain tag, that sort of thing. And then our begin play stuff, again, this would, could probably happen in the possessed by as well. Uh, and you know, some of that stuff could probably happen in the begin play. Um, it depends on your project. But uh, we listen for the health attribute changes. So when the health attribute changes, of course, we want to listen to that. And then if it's equal to zero or less, um, then we probably want to call our, our sort of die functionality where the character performs a death animation, they ragdoll, all the rest of it. Uh, and we bind to on immunity blocked gameplay effect delegate as well. So um, if a particular gameplay ability has been blocked by immunity, we cover that and uh, react to it accordingly however we want to for that particular case. So our attribute sets, we've got about four attribute sets uh, for different purposes. So we have our primary attributes. Uh, so these are things like our health, our max health, our shields, our max shields, uh, uh, you know, stamina, the, the core RPG style things. So uh, strength and fortitude and that kind of thing are in there. Uh, then we move on to our secondary attributes. Um, these are more in-depth stats, not needed by all units. Um, so there's things like our current status buildup, um, our elemental output, um, our current bonuses on that as well. Um, and then our tertiary attributes. So these are more bonuses, primarily used by the player character. Uh, so this is things like interaction and speed bonuses and other types of bonuses and stats. Um, and then last of all, we have weapon archetype specific attributes. Um, so some of our weapon archetypes require certain things like charge percentage, uh, spread, uh, charge count. Um, and looking to the future, I probably want to change some of these things. Um, so our, at our primary attributes, um, we'd probably want to split those out into even more basic attributes such as health, as I covered earlier on. So I think Lyra does this. It has a specific uh, health component and a health attribute set. Um, just to really keep things simple. So it means that at the moment, if we want to give uh, like a destructible object uh, our primary attribute set, it means that they've got things like strength and you know they just don't need those RPG style stats, a lot of them. Um, so we'd probably want to separate that out a little bit more. Um, our secondary attributes, we're pretty happy with that um, as it's quite self-encapsulated for uh, elemental things. Our tertiary stats, uh, some of these stats could be split into their own attribute set if I'm honest as well. Um, again, it's one of those things you sort of trial and test and you know what works and what doesn't work for your particular project. Uh, and our weapon archetype specific stuff, like some of these things could actually be replaced. Um, so instead of using an attribute, we're, at the moment I think some of our attributes, which are floats, uh, we're treating them as an integer. Uh, so what we could actually do is just apply a GE that stacks and then we could just count how many of that stack we have. Um, that's a, probably a better way and I'll probably be making that change in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so our day-to-day -day workflow, so during pre-production, um, it was very much the programmers that were doing a lot of the gameplay ability uh, implementations. 
Um, and we're creating a lot of custom tooling um, and functionality for gameplay effects and the game, uh, gameplay abilities as well. Um, so we're evolving a very complex calculation function for our damage. Um, so that's sort of one of the pros and cons, I think, that was covered in the, one of the other talks I mentioned earlier on, uh, is that the damage, uh, or sorry, the calculation functions can get very monolithic if you've got a lot happening in them. Uh, being an RPG, uh, we have a lot of different things that can contribute to a particular uh, damage calculation. Um, and you know, we could pass all of that information through as parameters into sub-functions, but I found the easiest way is to leave it as a big monolithic thing, and as long as it's well commented and like split into pragma regions and stuff, um, it kind of works out pretty well. Um, but then our day-to-day -day workflow, um, roughly, <laughs> has evolved to this. So the designers concept some sort of new ability with the team. Um, this could be a player ability or an AI's ability or something like that. Um, we then create the initial block outs, um, and that will be done by the designers usually. Uh, and then we play test and iterate. Uh, then we do some animation key pose block outs, um, and we introduce that into the ability. So previously we might have just had some kind of time based things, or we might have had a, a sort of generic ability that we've used previously uh, just to make that initial block out. And now we're sort of advancing that uh, to actually get the animation team involved. And we can start to determine any specific requirements as well. So if we need to move the character through space, uh, we tend to do that in a way that's uh, very arbitrary. So we'll have the character move uh, one meter forward during a lunge so that we can then multiply their route motion by the uh, play, montage, and wait for event, uh, which is, uh, if, if any of you have already started using GAS, you probably know that that's a, a key node in GAS is uh, playing a montage uh, for an attack, for example. Um, and then waiting for some sort of event to come out of it, such as uh, hitting a, another character with their basic attack. Uh, we play test and iterate again. Uh, then we get some more high quality animations involved. Uh, you know, we take that from initial block out of key poses, and now we're happy with uh, the general timing of things. We sort of tend to um, advance the animation quality a bit, and then we start to introduce audio and FX work in that as well. Uh, and you know, this is the way that we do it. Um, other studios might do it differently, and you know you find what works best for your particular project. Um, and you know what they could have really said is just play test and iterate all the way through because um, you know it's such a core cool thing. And with gas, you know play testing and iterating is so easy. Uh, you can hop into play an editor, try out your new ability, um, and then you can hop back out into the uh, gameplay ability blueprint or the gameplay effects blueprint, um, and just very quickly tweak some values um, and, and change the behavior of how it works. So some tips, tricks, and gotchas. Um, so I'd recommend making your own comprehensive C++ override classes. Uh, so for example, a lot of the core GAS C++ classes, such as the, game, uh, the ability system component, the ability system globals, uh, the gameplay abilities themselves, and the gameplay queue manager are all overridable. And I'd uh, very much suggest making your own ones so that you can expose what you need to Blueprint, because um, there's a lot of things that aren't exposed to Blueprint by default. Uh, and you'll find that, um, uh, at the start of production, you'll be like, oh, why is this not exposed? Oh, why is this not exposed? So you can expose out exactly what you need and what the team needs as well. Um, and of course, you can add a lot of extra stuff and functionality into those. Um, so as an example, uh, our, our override of the uh, gameplay ability class, um, we've added in extra things such as uh, which U input action uh, is this going to bind to? Um, so a U input action is a type of um, asset that comes with the enhanced input system. Um, so we can say that a particular um, ability listens for, um, for example, if it's a basic attack ability, it'll always be bound to our basic attack button. Uh, and of course, that particular input action might have been rebound by the uh, user through the enhanced input system, you know, via some game options or something. So uh, we don't hard bind to a particular input. Um, and we have custom ability input ID enum as well. Um, so originally we actually had an enum ID, but now we've switched over to a more tag-based system to ID um, a particular ability. Um, and we've added some booleans and bit fields for some core things that we want on all abilities. Um, so of course we could just add uh, some of these as tags, uh, as an asset tag on the gameplay ability in the, the class defaults. Um, but we found that uh, sometimes you could very easily miss a class, um, a particular gameplay ability blueprint uh, might get missed when you've added something to the, the project that needs to be added to like 90% of your gameplay abilities. Um, so instead, you know, you can add it at the C++ level, set it to true by default, and then just set it to false on those that don't need it anymore. Um, so we've got things like activate on granted, uh, activate on input, uh, can activate while interacting, uh, and all that sort of thing. Um, so again, these are, you know, 
just come across what you need on a project basis, but uh, we found that a lot of these were common enough to uh, sort of introduce at a C++ level. Uh, so we've got some async tasks. Um, so I'd, I'd say use the existing and the ability, uh, sorry, existing and create new C++ async ab uh, ability tasks. Uh, so these are fantastic. You sort of drag and drop these into your game playability blueprints um, and they're asynchronous so they can just run some sort of logic in the background, some sort of task, um, and then they can spit out at some sort of delegate um, to say that when they're done or when they failed or, or things like that. So there's some great out of the box ones. Um, so there's, you know, you can listen for when an attribute changes, when a cooldown changes, uh, when a gameplay tag is added or removed, um, and you can wait for a particular gameplay effect to be added or removed as well. Um, so I can't actually remember in the screenshot which are ours and which are uh, taken from community projects under MIT license and which of these have come with GAS by default. Um, but there's a whole bunch more here for you to look at as well. <laughs> um, so I know for a fact that the rotate to face one is something that we've added. Um, we just modified uh, one of the default, uh, I think it's like a move to. Um, and it, you know we had similar behavior. We wanted to know when we were either timing out to rotate or when we had actually reached our destination to rotate. Uh, and this is great when we want a character to rotate to face uh, something like a chest. Uh, so they might move up to it, and as they're moving up to it, they rotate at the same time. Um, and we want to know when that's done so we can start a particular animation. Um, so there's a problem here. Uh, my particular gameplay tag uh, match isn't working. So as I mentioned earlier on, uh, tags are hierarchical. So this is a couple of, um, this is a screenshot from Lyra. And as we can see here, they've got a status. Um, and then underneath that status, they've got a death, and then we can see if they're currently dead or dying. Um, and so there's an example of a printout below of like how those would appear if you were using them as a string tag. Um, and in this particular example, um, you know, in, in our game project, it's an RPG, so we equip different things, and I wanna know if a particular equipment piece uh, fits in the torso slot. Um, so that's easy, I can just query if its gameplay tag uh, matches a tag, uh, you know, if its parent tag fits in the torso slot. Uh, but this isn't working, um, and, and why is that? Um, so this might be something that you come across. Um, as you can see here, I've got the kind of parent tag uh, being queried first as tag one, and then I've got a more specific tag, which is the one I've pulled off of the piece of equipment as tag two. Um, and the reason that it's failing is because order matters. Um, so you have to, um, you can see an example here, I've got the uh, first statement down below, which is failing as false, um, and then I have a fixed statement above, which is just swapping the two values. Um, and so it's a little bit like if you're using a combined rotators, for example, like the order matters of which is A and which is B. Um, and this little snippet at the bottom is actually directly from the C++ comments. Um, so A1 matches tag A will return true, um, whereas A matches tag A1 will return false. Uh, so it's just a little something to watch out for uh, when you're using GAS, or even just the uh, wider gameplay tag system outside of GAS. Uh, so dead end ability, this is something that we run across on a regular basis, or at least we used to. Um, so each of our hero character slotted abilities um, block each other from activating. Um, and so if we activate an ability and then it gets canceled out of early for some reason and we have some sort of case that isn't handled um, and the ability never tells itself to end, then we still have this ability active and we're not doing anything. It's no animation or anything like that. Um, it's just stuck in this dead end state and it's blocking all of our other abilities from activating. Um, and you know, quite often you'll get um, someone like from QA come back and say, hey, um, like I can't do anything, none of the input's being responsive, like I can move the character around, but they're not um, doing any of their slotted abilities when I press them. Um, and that's probably because one of the abilities hasn't ended properly. Um, so in our particular case, um, you know, what should be happening? We activate an ability, we do a cool thing, and then we end the ability, and then we repeat that cycle for other abilities or the same ability. Um, but this is what actually happens. We activate the ability, we do cool things, and then we're kind of stuck in a state where we can't get out of it. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a, probably some unhandled branch of logic somewhere. So in this uh, simplified example, um, we can see that the uh, montage being interrupted isn't handled at all. Um, so when that happens, we never actually call end ability. Um, so we're just stuck in this activated ability with nowhere to go. Um, so again, in a simplified example, we just need a way of getting out of that, which is just on interrupted, we just get out of the ability. But of course, this could be any number of things. It could be a failed cast halfway through an ability. It could be an is valid check that's failing. Um, so yeah, it's just good to keep an eye on like the, the various execution flows in, in your blueprints and uh, check that they're all working as planned. Um, and in, in our game, we have a, a piece of UI that we can bring up to the developer and it tells them 
uh, what abilities are activated at the moment. So when they do fall into that state, they can press a button on the keyboard, it brings up this UI, and then they can report back to the dev team uh, exactly where the problem lies, which ability is broken. Um, so I'd recommend, recommend initializing your attributes with data tables in C++. Um, so here is a Lyra example again of a generic uh, gameplay effect. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of information on screen there. It's not very digestible. <laughs> Um, and you can imagine that when you're working on a complex RPG and you've got like tens of uh, attributes that you need to initialize on a character, uh, it, it's not very maintainable to like have a long list of 20 of these. This is just two attributes being modified here. Um, so there's actually a way to handle that uh, within GAS itself, um, if you have a look through to C++. Um, so the way that it works um, is we have a curve table um, that has a structured naming convention. So we have, for example, enemy unit A, primary attributes, health. Um, so the first part is the group name, uh, and the group name can be whatever you want, um, as long as you know what it is when you want to refer to it later on. Uh, the secondary part is the name of your attribute set um, class, and the third part is the name of the attribute within that attribute set that you want to be modifying. And as you can see here, we've got some characters going from level one through to level six. Uh, and you know the values are increasing uh, as, they, as they go through that stage. Um, so we want to use this data to initialize. And of course, designers love uh, curve tables and uh, spreadsheets. So they can take this straight from uh, Excel or Google Docs or whatever they use uh, and import it straight into the engine. Uh, and then rather than having to create a gameplay effect where we have to set up each of these and bind it to a particular row, uh, what we can in fact do is just uh, use this C++ class, um, or, or rather struct, uh, F attribute set init a discrete levels, a nice concise name there. Um, but basically what that means is that we are um, setting, you know, we're initializing the attribute set uh, based on discrete individual levels. Um, so here's a bit of the code commenting. Uh, so uh, this large <laughs> screenshot here um, is, you can see that the, the C++ documentation is, is quite good in that regard. So I'd recommend going and having a look at it if you're familiar with C++. Um, and it's just gone through the same as what I have here. So we can see that they've got default, um, they've got hero one, and then of course they could have unit two, unit three, um, and then they sort of move on to uh, the, the curve table there. Um, and then the second smaller comment at the top is uh, for the code class there, because this one here is for F attribute set initter, I think, um, which is the parent to the one that I've outlined above. Um, so yeah, a little gotcha with this one as well. Um, we found with 5.0, there's some great optimizations in the game engine, but it actually made our game crash. Um, so the, the reason for this is that there are, when the curve tables um, get cooked, um, it actually emits all of the keys that are the same. Uh, so if your character is the same, has the same defense value from level zero to 10, for example, um, then it will, rather than holding zero, one, two, three, four, all the way through to 10 with the, um, the same defense value, um, it'll actually uh, bake that down into key zero and key 10 because those are where it starts and stops and then it will continue. Um, and so as you go through the code, this is probably one to view at home <laughs> afterwards, uh, but some boilerplate logic here um, where I've taken uh, the uh, attribute set initter uh, where it preloads the attribute set data and I've actually commented out the following statement um, so we don't uh, skip over cooked curve tables uh, when the uh, next key in the sequence to key x is key x plus y, where i, sorry, y is more than one. Um, so basically what this means is, you know, what I said a minute ago, where those keys are stripped out, um, we don't run into unexpected issues. Um, so sort of relating to that code as well. Um, we have a modified version here, which uh, actually this is the original version. Um, Again, this is probably one that's best with viewing at home so you can compare the code. Um, I think there's a slide missing here, potentially. That's not great. <laughs> okay, so basically what was happening was um, there's a little modification that you can make with the code, and I'll share this online afterwards. I don't know if it's in this code here because um, I did have a bit where it's actually pointing it out, but basically uh, where the expected level was increasing um, up to the next level, if we couldn't find that particular key, um, we would then just assume that we're using the last one still because if we get to key six um, and it doesn't exist, then we can assume that it's still the same value as key five because it's just been stripped out during cooking. Um, I don't know if this has changed. Uh, this is in 5.0 uh, initial release, uh, but this was something that we stumbled across. And again, all of this code is just um, a duplication of the 
uh, f attribute set and if uh, discrete levels, uh, which is a few modifications. So uh, create custom code to pass through GE values and tags. Uh, so for our project, we have one gameplay effect for dealing with damage. And then that gameplay effect has a lot of conditional gameplay effects for applying things like stun buildup and burn buildup and all the different types of elemental buildup in the game. Now, if we're running some complex calculation through damage and we work out something like we've rolled for critical damage, then how do we pass that through to one of the other gameplay effects that might need it? Um, so we have GE damage here, we have our complex calculation function, then we have all the conditionals which then do their own build up calculation to see how much they should apply. And of course, for example, if a um, particular build up uh, does double build up when the damage was critical, um, we need to pass that information through somehow because as it is, um, we can't get hold of that information. Um, so what we actually end up doing um, is we have these couple of custom functions that we've made. Um, we essentially apply a, a dynamic asset tag to the gameplay ability, uh, sorry, to the gameplay effect, um, and then we make that trickle down through the other specs that are linked to this particular effect. Uh, and we do the same thing again um, with uh, set by call attack magnitudes. Uh, so this allows our designers in the uh, graphs, they might put data dot damage equals 100, which is great for the uh, top level GE damage. Um, and because we don't want to create additional effects that are linked to that, we just want to use the existing stun buildups and everything that are already on that damage. Um, we then allow that to pass through additional things like stun buildup. So we create the one GE damage, apply um, a set by caller tag magnitude um, of data dot damage equals 100, for example, and then data dot stun buildup equals 20%, for example. Um, so we allow all of that data to trickle down. So this is a bit of boilerplate. Um, example, um, so you can see I'm calling our custom ability system global functions, and those are here on the next slide, so feel free to use those in your own projects. Um, it basically just does a, um, a recursive uh, trickle down of information uh, through to those conditional effects. Uh, so the benefit of that is that you just create your one outgoing gameplay effect from a gameplay ability, and you don't have to uh, create lots of individual additional effects. You can just let that one a bit, uh, gameplay effect handle it. So onto our gas systems, and I can see I've only got two minutes left according to this, but uh, we'll, we'll go through what we can. Um, so our, our equipment stats, being an RPG, uh, when you get a new piece of equipment, you wanna put it on and you want it to reflect all of the stats that come with it. So plus max shields, uh, plus strength, all that kind of thing. Um, so there's a variety of stats. Um, so while it's equipped implies some sort of duration, but we don't know how long that duration is um, because we don't know when they're gonna unequip the uh, piece of gear. So we don't want it to be an instant effect because as covered earlier on, instant effects actually change the base value and we want to revert back to that base value after we've taken the equipment off. Um, so we actually will probably end up going for an infinite um, gameplay effect, which I'll run through in a moment on the next slide. Um, so it's important that we can dynamically add and remove the attribute modifiers when we equip and unequip. Uh, it's important that we don't modify the direct base. I've gone ahead of myself and covered a lot of these already. Um, so our equipment data holds a simple ID of a attribute um, uh, versus its modifier value. Um, and then we look up that ID um, to get the particular attribute uh, reference um, so that we can actually create a dynamic gameplay effect uh, in C++. Uh, so that, you know, every time we're modifying uh, some stats when we equip a piece of gear, uh, you know, we don't have a particular gameplay effect in the uh, in the engine ready to use in the gameplay assets. We just create one dynamically on the fly. Uh, and it's important that we use an infinite duration policy so that we can remove it whenever we're ready to. Uh, as it's infinite um, and we're adding on the modifiers, uh, then the base value will remain unchanged and we can always revert back to it later, which is exactly what we want. So here's another little bit of code that you can use yourself. I think uh, half of this code is uh, used uh, sort of taken from an MIT licensed community project uh, by Tranek uh, on GitHub. And uh, yeah, I think we've sort of modified this slightly ourselves as well. I've put a note in there uh, for make unique object name because we're creating a new object at runtime. Um, we ran into a little bit of issues where it's actually assigning the same name as one that already existed, even though we're calling make unique name. Um, so we just got a simple iterator um, that makes sure that we always increment past what the previous one was. Um, and so that was for adding, a uh, equipping a piece of gear, and this is for removing, it's much simpler, we just simply remove the gameplay effects uh, via the cached handle that we have here on the left hand side in our header file. 
So ability traits, um, we wanted to allow the designers to enact quick changes. Um, they don't want to have to trawl through a uh, blueprint to find a specific value for like a damage coefficient or something like that. Um, and we're thinking forward to post-launch as well. Uh, we don't want to uh, commit entire patches just to change a couple of float values. Um, so we wanted something uh, that we can distribute via our online services if possible. Um, so we have an ability traits table system. And what this is is basically a, a, a table that has a gameplay tag, um, and that matches up with some sort of float value. And then we've got our own little dev comment uh, inside there just to give a bit of context on what that information is. Um, and then, of course, we can construct this data from you know, uh, a JSON string, for example. Um, and then whenever a gameplay ability wants a particular piece of information, it can just look it up from this table by calling a particular tag. Um, so the designers never have to touch the uh, values in the gameplay ability blueprint. They can actually just modify this data table, uh, which again can be on some external thing like uh, sheets or something like that, and then they can reimport it. So our ability entity system. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think is generic enough to potentially actually be part of the main gas plugin. Um, so we identified that there's actually a lot of core entities in our game. Um, we have things like projectiles, areas of effect, constructs and familiars, that sort of thing. Um, and taking inspiration from the gameplay effect and gameplay effect handle kind of architecture, uh, we created our own. Um, so we have a struct, which is a ability entity spec handle, um, and that has a U property inside it, which is a data wrapper object for our ability entity spec. Um, there's the ability spec entity spec object, and that holds some data, which is a struct, um, which is a specification of our ability entity. Uh, and that then holds uh, the definition to a base class of some sort, so it could be uh, some sort of blueprint override class for a projectile. Um, it could be um, a, a really bo a base class for uh, an area of effect. Uh, and then we have a generic type, which is overridable, which is a ability entity override params, so we could provide things like uh, a projectile override params, which has all of the radius, uh, the uh, initial launch speed of that projectile, and, and all that sort of thing. And here's uh, an example. Um, it holds like a gameplay effect handle. The entity to spawn once it dies, so we can daisy chain. Um, so if an, uh, a projectile dies, then it will then spawn an AOE, which will then spawn some familiars. You know, we can go crazy with it if we really want to. Uh, we've got things like max lifetime, warm up time, cool down time, you know, whatever it is that that particular entity needs to know. Um, but sort of from this information here, uh, you can actually make anything that, something that's generic enough that, you know, you don't need to know what the entity is um, because you can override all of this to suit whatever's in your project. Um, so if, as I've said here, you know, you can have projectile params, um, AOE params, construct params, familiar params, uh, basically anything that you need to suit your project, um, and that can then all be generically held um, inside this neat data structure uh, that we can uh, sort of uh, mutate and pass around. Uh, and because it's daisy chains, uh, we can uh, just keep that going with some really crazy combos if we really wanted. And of course, we can actually transfer the ownership of this. So if we deflect a projectile, we deflect that projectile, and then it will continue to spawn all of its AOEs and everything cool after that as well. So getting to the end now, um, so there's some community resources here. As I mentioned, uh, there's a fantastic project on GitHub uh, by a user called Tranic. Uh, it's under MIT license, so you're free to modify that um, and, and use it in commercial products and things. Uh, so it's extremely uh, generous of Tranic. Um, it's a really fantastic learning resource. Uh, and of course, there's the Unreal Slacker Discord server. So if you're not in there already, there's thousands and thousands of developers in there. Uh, and there's actually a specific channel for the gameplay ability system um, where people are sharing a lot of useful information and helping uh, troubleshoot each other's problems. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Um, it's my goofy Twitter handle, which is my <laughs> uh, gaming uh, handle, but feel free to follow me on Twitter and ask me any questions that you might have. It's my personal website as well, and of course, the Silent Games. So if you want to follow us and see what our next game is and follow announcements, then feel free. But uh, yeah, thank you for listening. and.